Hey guys, like always, just wanted to thank everybody for supporting us here over at the channel. East Coast Lodge has grown so much in the last week, and I just wanted to thank you guys. And we know that you guys have really been liking our GTA Story series. We got a lot of them on the way, but they take a lot of research and time to make. So don't forget to like and subscribe if you want more content like this. With all that out of the way, let's get right into it. This story today is probably one of the most crazy ones that we've talked about on the channel so far. And a lot of you have probably heard this story already before, but I think you'd be surprised on how deep this story actually goes. Because today, we're going to be talking about the daylight assassination of Antonio Forda. On November 4th, 2019, Antonio Forda was driving to go get lunch at an upscale restaurant called the Via Alergo in Etobicoke, Ontario. But little did he know, while driving there, he was actually being tailed by a group of two assassins. While arriving at his destination, Antonio would leave his car around 12.40pm to meet with his friend, Joseph Catropa, to enter the restaurant together. The two men following him would park nearby in a black pickup truck. When the time was right, one of them jumped out and fired 12 shots at Antonio, striking him 9 times. The driver of the black pickup truck would pull up and pick up the shooter. The two would then flee the scene, leaving Antonio Forda lying in the middle of the parking lot. Toronto would be shocked of the brutal daylight shooting in a relatively safe part of the GTA. But little did they know Antonio Forda was actually linked to organized crime and was just another casualty in a brutal gang war. Antonio Forda, also known as Tony Scratch, was linked to the Italian mob. And before you say Canada doesn't have the mafia like that, well, you'd be dead wrong. Toronto's history with the Italian mob can mainly be linked to the early 1950s, with the Siderno group, who would immigrate from the Italian region of Calabria. The Siderno group, also known as the Drangheta crime family, would become a prominent force within the Canadian underworld. With the Papilia family moving to Hamilton and the Rizzuto family setting up shop in Montreal, they would both enforce their rule on these regions. In the United States, the Mafia are primarily from the Sicily region of Italy and have a commission made up of five families hailing from New York City. In Canada, there are technically six and still do have a lot of power, but definitely aren't as ingrained as they are in United States society. Like I said, the United States mob had formed separately from Canada's, and having about a hundred years more of history giving them time to ingrain their influence. That being said, they would both formally merge in the mid-1980s, and both Cosa Nostra and the Drangheta crime family are synonymous with each other today. In the US, many crime families claim to not mess around with the narcotics business, but here in Canada, it's their bread and butter. From the mid 2000s to 2010s, in Montreal, the Rizzuto crime family pretty much controlled the narcotics trade, with access to its shipping docks, one of the largest ports in North America. With connections to the Rizzuto family in Montreal, the Toronto crime families would push their product along with their own, making a killing in Toronto. But having such influence in the streets was bound to make them enemies. One of them being a criminal organization known as the Wolf Pack. Hailing from British Columbia, they were made up of three leaders from Vancouver and Surrey's most influential gangs. They were formed in 2011 by the Bacon Brothers, leaders of the Red Scorpions, Larry Amaro of the Hells Angels, and James Rayek from the Independent Soldiers. The three gangs that made up the Wolf Pack were embroiled in a brutal gang war back in British Columbia. It'd be over control of the drug trade and would force some members to spread east. On June 7, 2016, Secure Singh Dio, age 34, who had moved from Vancouver to Toronto earlier that year, who had been an ex-member of the Independent Soldiers and was believed to be setting up operations in Toronto, was gunned down near Young and Ellington Street around 3 p.m. He was found struck multiple times sitting in a white Range Rover. Witnesses described two gunmen that were actually disguised as construction workers wearing reflective vests fleeing the scene. And this brutal daylight shooting would go on to be linked in a spree of unsolved homicides. 
shots yet again would ring out in downtown Toronto. With another member of the Wolf Pack, Anastasis Laventes from Quebec was shot down outside his condo near George Street and Adelaide Avenue. This would happen a year after the murder of Sakura Singh Dio in 2016, with this situation occurring on January 30th, 2017, it would only lead to another brutal homicide. As a man named Cosimo Ernesto Camiso would begin beefing with Ernestos Leventes and his brother in early 2016. There had been numerous death threats towards Camiso and his family by the Leventes brothers. And the situation would only intensify when Ernestos was killed in 2017. And, unfortunately, in 2018, Cosimo Ernesto Camiso would pull into the parking lot of his house with him beside him in the passenger seat was Chantel Almeida. Camiso would exit the vehicle when a black Honda Civic pulled up and fired a hail of bullets. Cosimo would be found lifeless laying on the ground. And unfortunately, Chantel Almeida, sitting in the passenger seat, was also killed during the shooting. Camiso was linked to the Drangheta crime families, with his father being a high-ranking member. Another homicide of a public crime figure, Hamilton's Mastino crime family, Angelo Mastino, one of two brothers leading the operations throughout Hamilton in the GTA, was gunned down outside his home in 2017 when his truck was also hit with a hail of bullets. All homicides remain unsolved to this day, and were all considered to be well-planned assassination plots carried out by professionals leaving the police scrambling. This leads us to 2019 to the homicide of Antonio Forda, who as of today is the only homicide to be solved. And here's where things get a little bit weird, because the two shooters were actually neither members of the Italian Mafia or the Wolf Pack but were well equipped to carry out the hit and were known as shooters out in the streets of Toronto and allegedly were paid 60 grand for the hit. Syed Mohadeen, also known as the rapper Flippa, was alleged to be the driver of the black pickup truck, which was a Ford F-150 found burnt out in the outskirts of Toronto. The other was Kashawn Brown, also known as the rapper YS, and he was believed to be the gunman. Flippa is a drill rapper in North York and is known as a shooter in the ongoing feuds in Toronto. He's affiliated with the rap label GGG, which is primarily made up of rappers that are gang members from Jungle. He can also be seen rapping alongside the rapper Top 5, who I talked about in my last video. And both of them are known for their uncensored take on the street life, lyrics detailing robberies, and taking out rival gang members. YS's story is very similar. He's also a drill rapper from the Toronto region. Inspired by the genre hailing from Chicago, he had also gained a reputation as a stepper in the streets. The only difference was he was actually only 18 years old. The police had a mountain of evidence against them, there even being an undercover cop that witnessed the shooting. He was nearby watching the restaurant in an unrelated investigation. He managed to follow them fleeing all the way onto the 401 and got a pretty good look at the truck they were driving before the suspects were out of his sight. There was also surveillance footage of them pulling up and carrying out the shooting. And they had posted on social media, quote, they paid us 60 G's in order to fuel their reputation in the streets and gain clout from claiming the shooting. They were seen flexing with the $60,000 and the police believed that they had carried out the hit. In court, Flippa's defense was that the video was only part of his rap image. And any other photos of him holding guns and lyrics detailing shootings were also linked to the fact of him trying to maintain his rap image. YS would unfortunately be found shot dead in an Airbnb in Surrey, British Columbia. Many people believe his close friend and rapper under the same label of Wasp Gang, known as 22 Neat, is believed to having YS killed in a setup. But what's really sketchy is Flippa would pretty much go down for the shooting in court, and it seemed that they barely pressed him on where he'd gotten the money from. 
And the Italian mob isn't really known for going after the shooter, but would want to retaliate by getting whoever ordered the hit. But Surrey, British Columbia is where the Bacon Brothers are from, one of the founding members of the Wolfpack. Maybe they had suspicions of the younger 18 year old shooter not being able to keep his mouth shut and would fold in court due to the fact he had his whole life ahead of him. And Flippa was actually 33 years old and was a seasoned veteran from the street and was obsessed with maintaining his image. And because of this, they knew he wouldn't flip. Or maybe they weren't able to get to him and now they know he lives in fear of being locked up with rival gangs. Flippa is also being charged for a separate homicide. So he's definitely a guy who's got a lot on his mind and definitely doesn't want to be making any more enemies than he already has. So let me know what you guys think in the comments. Did they go too hard on Flippa without maybe trying to make a deal with him? Was Flippa just another scapegoat for organized crime? Did YS's past in the streets catch up to him? Or was he just a pawn in a covert gang war? Maybe the police know a lot more than we think and didn't really care to go after Flippa and find out where this money came from. And investigations that might be going on in British Columbia that might interfere with investigations going on in Toronto. But who knows, the police could actually be completely lost right now and with researching other stories, uh, my bet is that's the case. Also, many Wolfpack members have been charged and are in prison, but I don't think that stops their influence out in the streets. With organized crime, sometimes it actually intensifies it. With YS also being killed the same day as another rapper affiliated with Wasp Gang, his name being Bully. Or Bavelli, let me know which one it is in the comments. Sorry if I butchered that one, guys. This would only increase suspicions. Also, the rapper 22 Neat, who is believed to be linked to the homicide of YS, would also be killed in a shootout that occurred in the middle of the street in Edmonton, Alberta. All three rappers being from the Driftwood area of North York. There's a tragic amount of loss in this story and the police believe that organized crime have been using this method of hiring younger men obsessed with their reputation and were lured in with fast money to carry out hits on high-ranking targets. And I hope that the Canadian police aren't just catching on to this fact because this is a method that's been used since the 1960s. This method was probably used earlier on than that, but I do know for a fact that Joe Gallo and triad groups would use blanket gangs in order to wage war out in the streets without implicating themselves or their high-ranking members. Also, within Toronto, there have been numerous cases where this has already happened. With the Chin Pak and Asian assassins used by the triads to wage war out in the streets, also, in my previous video, Jamaican organized crime used blanket gangs in Toronto as well. And the police have shown that they're failing to adapt to the complexity of organized crime and the methods they use to conduct their business. Or like I said before, maybe they're just playing stupid, but uh, I don't know. But what I do know is it leaves younger criminals to become ingrained in the street life after being used to carry out such high profile hits and most likely will go down for the murder with organized crime never having to get their hands dirty. So I really hope you guys enjoyed that video. But I just thought it was a crazy story that forced me down a rabbit hole when I was researching it. If you have any other suggestions for videos like this, don't forget to leave it down below. And don't forget to like and subscribe because we got a whole lot more on the way. We also have a whole bunch of other type of content coming your guys way. So don't forget to comment on that and let us know what type of stuff you guys like, as we always love to get feedback. And like always, thank you guys so much for the support and the awesome comments. I hope you guys have a good one and look forward to see you in the next one.